Welcome to the last series of Jacob Lawrence prints to be featured in the Mitchell Gallery's online exhibitions, Hiroshima. I'm Lucinda Edinburgh, the art educator for the Mitchell Gallery at St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, and we're pleased to be able to offer a virtual tour while we are under COVID restrictions. On August 6, 1945, the U.S. B-29 aircraft Enola Gay dropped a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima, an embarkation port and industrial center that was the site of a major military headquarters, and then three days later, another bomb was dropped onto Nagasaki. African-American painter Jacob Lawrence captured the horror of the U.S. attack on Japan in the Hiroshima series 1983, and this was his reinterpretation of John Hersey's Hiroshima, published in the New Yorker magazine August 31, 1946. Jacob Lawrence was born in Atlantic City in 1917 and moved around a lot in early childhood. In fact, the young Lawrence's parents, Rosalie, was a domestic worker from Virginia, and his father, Jacob, was a railroad cook and miner from South Carolina. And they were among the many who moved from the South to the North in the first years of the Great Migration. The Great Migration is documented in his early series of 60 paintings that were divided up between the Museum of Modern Art and the Phillips Collection, where they still remain. Lawrence's parents separated when he was seven, and at that time, Rosalie Lawrence, his mother, and her children moved to Easton, Pennsylvania, at a time where this was a prominent hub for the steel industry. And due to job losses, and her inability to care for them, the children were temporarily placed in foster care. Lawrence was eventually reunited with his mother in Harlem, New York uh, at the age of 13 in, in 1930. Once Lawrence was in Harlem, he was surrounded by the shakers and movers of that time. This is the late Harlem Renaissance. And he studied under Charles Henry Austin and Augustus Savage. He was at the Harlem Art Workshop. He was at the Harlem Community Art Center. And the art workshop was held in the basement of the uh, West 135th Street Library. There were a number of poets and writers that led him to the Arthur Schomburg collection at the library, which later became the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And he appears to have been quite a voracious reader. It was from there that he discovered the writings of C.L.R. James uh, and the Black Jacobins from the life of Toussaint Louverture, which we showed previously. Lawrence studied at the American Artist School and then he received funding through the Works Progress Administration once he became old enough. And then while going through his training, Lawrence established a style that he named dynamic cubism, I think somewhat inspired by Matisse. And his style was noted by angular, colorful, flat shapes that fit together like jigsaw puzzles. The Hiroshima series came about through Sidney Schiff. He was the owner of the Limited Editions Club in New York and Schiff commissioned Lawrence to make illustrations for a book of his choice, and so Lawrence selected John Hersey's Hiroshima. Lawrence wrote, In 1981, I was invited by the Limited Editions Club of New York to illustrate a book of my choosing from a list of the club's many titles. I selected the book Hiroshima because of the brilliant writer John Hersey. This work was selected because of its power, insight, scope, and sensitivity, as well as for its overall content. My intent was to illustrate a series of events that were taking place at the moment of the dropping of the bomb, August 6, 1945. The challenge for me was to execute eight works, a marketplace, a playground, a street scene, a park, farmers, a family scene, a man with birds, and a boy with a kite, and not a particular country, 
not a particular city, and not a particular people. John Hersey, who lived from 1917 to 1993, was an American journalist who wrote an unbellished account of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Japan, by the American forces during the closing of the Second World War, uh, 1939 to 1945. And it was first published in the New Yorker magazine of the year after Japan's unconditional surrender to the Allies. He was anxious to see what happened with the survivors after his first visit there. So he based his story on interviews that he conducted with six survivors that were within 2,000 feet of the blast in the days and in the weeks afterward. And it's an interesting collection of people that he interviewed. The 31,000 word story was originally planned to be a four-part series, but it was confined to just the one August 31st issue with no indication of the narrative included inside. There were no cartoons or talk of the town or the usual features because the editors, and E.B. White was one of them actually, felt that few Americans understood the devastating impact of nuclear weapons since the war, and they wanted no distractions from the content. So just as Hersey's writing was unembellished with his objective and unsentimental writing that left the viewers and readers only with facts, Jacob Lawrence's interpretation follows that. The article caused a national sensation when it was first published, and it still remains widely noted as one of the finest pieces of journalism of the 20th century, labeled new journalism uh, as it combined the storytelling technique with nonfiction reportage. Hiroshima was later reissued in book form and is still widely considered the New Yorker's most popular piece. So Lawrence took Hersey's account of those survivors and reimagined the event in a more abstract, universal perspective. This series, although just as ambitious as his other narratives, is much different in style and attitude and shapes than his previous works. Alan Vaughn, who wrote an apt description in a review of the catalog resume of Lawrence's work by Peter T. Nesbitt and Michelle Dubois, said, you know, at the core of his being, Mr. Lawrence was a humanist. And I think that's really evident in all of these pieces. Vaughn went on to say that the face of devastation strikes like thunder or lightning at a moment of contact in daily lives and activities of human beings that just end abruptly in a flash of light and heat by the nuclear bomb. And Lawrence captures the moment after the bomb has dropped. In this piece uh, called Playground, Lawrence has painted the faces red uh, to reveal white skeletal figures through his abstract composition. Lawrence captures this shock and destruction in Hersey's account, and it immediately demands an emotion and an empathy from the viewer in looking at this series of Hiroshima. The uh, dancing in a circle uh, with what looks to be the tail of a kite doesn't seem to be productive to really go anywhere and the dog in the lower portion of the composition is even skeletal, red and white. And so, again, these figures don't depict any particular race. Lawrence intentionally keeping these figures universal and that this could happen anywhere to anyone. This slide, The Family. The family is sitting at the table as in the family would Again, a mix of white skeletal figures. And up top, the ceiling is crumbling. There's a dead bird that sits in the window. 
but there's no particular indication that this is a Japanese household. Lawrence, in a very typical style for his compositions, uses a lot of geometric forms, both in the shapes of the silkscreen, but also in the negative spaces as well. And notice that the family is looking up. And Vaughn has even said, you know, in a sweeping instant, people became irradiated skeletons without becoming conscious about what had happened to them. The effect is chilling and the global message is clear. This image of people sitting in the park shows people sitting in a semicircle and the circular lines of this barren tree brings them all together compositionally. The people are essentially dying, in part indicated by their faces, but also by the lack of leaves that are on the tree, except for one or two here that are astray. You can see the skeletal faces on the people, the man sitting on the bench uh, with the cane at his knee. And Lawrence is relating the experience as he imagined it would feel like if this were in his own community. This next image of market, there's several things I'd like to point out here. First of all, again, distorted figures in the market, so it has an emptiness and not the normal bustle of activity that an open market would have. The fish are dead, which normally one expects, but in this case, they're skeletal and sinister. Notice the teeth uh, that are on them and the black eyes. People have their faces covered. They have their hands up uh, to their face as if uh, they were experiencing sort of a flash. Uh, part of the ceiling is floating above. And the black birds that are seen on the right um, that are in cages, it's, it's difficult to tell uh, if they are alive or not. The other part with this that I wanted to point out is this shows the series. It was a series of 35 silkscreen prints after the paintings were completed. This is um, series number 18 uh, that you see 18 over 35 on the left. And then on the right you see Jacob Lawrence's signature and then the apostrophe 83. So that gives the date. So this series was done as a series of eight paintings and then done as a series of loose silkscreen prints of which there were 35 editions. This image of man with the birds, again the figure is looking up and holding on to a dead bird and as it seems as though when he reaches up the bird just falls apart. The, the feathers are just dying away from, from the bird's body. And so that's much like the reflection of the man's own skin that appears to be uh, peeling back, again indicated by the red. You see that it's a barren background, just these browns and sort of uh, olive greens, so there's no vegetation, no flowers, no indication even of the flash. And you see on the bench uh, part of a bird or, or a bird that has already fallen. This image of the boy with the kite, you may notice that none of the objects, kites, ceilings, birds, things that sort of belong in the air or are always suspended in some way, uh, are almost always found on the ground or just barely floating. In this case, the distorted figures look up to the sky with um, bent hands. The father has his hand on his shoulder, son, which would be a, an affectionate gesture. And again, huddled together, uh, they're looking up, you know, huddled under falling ceilings. And as consistent with the other prints, the face and hands are red. So in this series of these boldly articulated full screen prints, Lawrence sympathetically captures these intense emotions and vivid impressions of Hersey's account. And again, imagining what would be experienced in this noiseless flash, uh, and then the forecasting of the imminent death um, 
that's given through the skeletal-like appearances of their bodies. This image of farmers seen here, there's nothing to harvest. Again, a great void. The ground at Hiroshima was greatly irradiated, so there was some concern that nothing would be able to grow on the ground following uh, the bombing. About 90% of Hiroshima was destroyed with about 140,000 deaths, including those that died as a result of radiation exposure. This had been a city of about 350,000 people. So even though the farmers have rakes, they, they seem to break apart and just sort of crumble. And all of this conveys the devastation and, of course, the uncertainty about what to do next. The street scene here presents more confusion and chaos than so many of the other images. Although none of these prints are simple and quiet, this shows a ceiling from a building falling and Lawrence is depicting the physical and emotional responses you know, through this event. So as you would be looking up as one is apt to do if there's something falling unknown from the sky and sort of protecting themselves as well. Hersey writes about the confusion among the survivors as the event happened so quickly they really didn't know what had taken place. There were a lot of theories, uh, one that had thought that perhaps um, the B-29s had poured gasoline over the city and then set a few bombs. There were a number of descriptions given in Hersey's book. The original paintings, the eight paintings that are in tempera and gouache, are part of the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts permanent collection. And they were sent into conservation uh, in Philadelphia through the Conservation Center of Art and Historic Artifacts in Philadelphia. And their description on their website has a, a lovely description saying that uh, this was conceived towards the end of his long and multifaceted career and the paintings bring together numerous overlapping formal and narrative concerns in a way that distinguishes the series from his earlier work. The settings are universal, the identities of the victims beyond issues of race or nationality, politics or religion, and they achieve a poignancy that is grounded in Lawrence's lifelong engagement and humanistic themes. The Hiroshima series was printed as eight six silk screens on Somerset paper, which was a very popular grade of printmaking paper developed in the 1970s. And as mentioned earlier, there were uh, 35 uh, in the edition with 10 artist proofs and then five uh, printer's proofs. And it was uh, then published by the Limited Editions Club in New York and printed by uh, Alexander uh, Heinrichi, who was the master printer. Heinrichi was originally from Vienna and was the uh, master printer for Andy Warhol, uh, Robert Rauschenberg, Roy Lichtenstein, Robert Indiana, Jasper Johns, and so many others. And so then there were uh, published books, a limited edition of 1500, which you see here on the right, that included a poem by uh, Penn Warren, and then it was signed by all three uh, of the collaborators. During Jacob Lawrence's lifetime, he received numerous awards and honors, including the National Medal of the Arts in 1990, the NAACP Annual Great Black Artists Awards, far too many for me, me to list in this presentation. But his work has been the subject of several major retrospectives that have traveled nationally. And just recently, there was an exhibition in the Metropolitan Museum of Art where one of the paintings missing from the series was discovered. And so this year is the 75th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. And so I would like to conclude this presentation 
with Jacob Lawrence's words because I think there's something really to contemplate. And he wrote, Is it not ironic that we have produced great scientists, great musicians, great orators, chess players, philosophers, poets, and great teachers, and at the same time, we have developed the capability and the genius to create the means to devastate and to completely destroy our planet Earth with all its life and beauty. How could we develop such creative minds and at the same time develop such a destructive instrument? Only God knows the answer. Let us hope that someday, at some time, he will give us the answer to this very perplexing question. Thank you for listening in on this presentation, and I hope you've been given some insight into the work of Jacob Lawrence. I'd like to thank Jeff Landau from Landau Traveling Exhibitions in Los Angeles, California, for his willingness to present this exhibition that otherwise would have been on our walls online, and also to the collector Alatesh Kabedi for allowing us to show these, and she will be speaking in an interview on December 13th, so please check out our website. Thank you, be well, be safe.